evening. I know we are, and we're going to have an awesome night. We're going to talk about one of the, um, probably one of the most talked about things going on right now in sports. How about some softball? More specifically, how about some softball recruiting? So tonight we're going to jump in, and we've got literally three uh, of the experts in recruiting for softball with us. We're going to start off tonight talking about a few little odd and things that a lot of times people think is, is good information uh, that they may get from coaches or they may get from clubs or directors or all kinds of different things, club coaches, travel coaches, high school coaches, uh, something they read on the internet. And the thing is, is the process itself doesn't always apply evenly across the board because every individual athlete has a different recruiting process. Again, I'm Coach Robert Cable with NSR. I'm going to introduce to you Jay Roberson in just a moment and Tanya Slimp and Rachel Brown. I'm going to, get to tell you a little bit about each one of those. I'll start off of here with, with Tanya Slim. Tanya comes to us. Tanya is no, no stranger to recruiting. She has been a part of the softball community for many, many years on the West Coast and then recently up on the East Coast where she just finished a tenure at uh, NYU coaching. Uh, she is one of the I don't know, one of the bright spots of recruiting because she has so much knowledge. Tanya, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, Rob. It's good to have you with us. Now, are you up on the East Coast or the West Coast right now? Right now, I'm in New York, and I head to California in a couple of days for Zoom. Got you. Okay, that's awesome. So you're headed that direction. Well, we're glad to have you. Looking forward to hearing some uh, absolutely amazing information tonight that you'll be able to share with us, and truthfully, almost in real time because you just, you just finished up a season. You've been a long time part of NSR and you took a sabbatical to go and, and be a part of NYU. The next thing, hey Jay, ladies go first. So you gotta wait till the end. So next we're gonna go to Rachel Brown. Rachel is no stranger at all to the softball community. She's been a part of it her entire life. And so Rachel was a great player at Troy University, was a standout uh, pitcher there, left-handed pitcher. She had a tremendous career. Uh, she finished up her career there. She came to work several years ago back here at NSR and has been such an impact and had such an impact on the softball community in the South and all over the country. Rachel, how are you doing today? I'm great. And you forgot one important detail about me, former NSR athlete also. There you go. It may be just as important as anything else. And we also forgot one more important detail about Rachel too. You can't see this, but in about – a month, four weeks, three weeks, Rachel's going to bring a little Bambino into the world. So we're going to have another another ball player come into the world. I don't know what they're going to play yet, Rachel, but I'm sure there'll be a ball, a stick, or something involved in that kid's life. I'm sure as well. <laughs> Congratulations to you and Lucas. We can't wait to see that, that bundle of joy. Last and not least, we'll bring over Jay Roberson. For those of you that uh, are in the softball community from a coaching standpoint, collegially, all the way down to – uh, the community of travel coaches. Many of you know the name of Jay Roberson. Jay's been a part of that community now for probably almost 20 years. Uh, he's probably as well known with the Bolts organization uh, as there is. Does so many things with the, with the showcases concerning the Bolts and also communicating with coaches all throughout the country. Jay, how you doing, man? Doing great. Glad to be here. Man, we are glad you're here tonight too. Well, look, we've done the we've done the intro thing. We're running a minute or two behind. Let's jump off the let's jump off the boat here and let's get rolling here. So, one of the things we want to start on. I was sitting there the other day, uh, and I was I was listening to some some families talking, and, and here's what I heard them say. They said, "Well, you know what? That uh, we we really can't do anything until September 1st. Uh, you know, after our sophomore year for recruiting." And uh, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, "Who told you that?" I mean, that's true. Yeah, the D1 coach can't call you until a certain day. It's September 1st. But identification, recognition, evaluation. Tanya, I want to come to you. You just, uh, you know, you just got through. Or Rachel, we're going we're gonna to jump off with you here. This piece of this is, is in, really important. And the reason I'm going to bring you in is because I've been around long enough and old enough to remember a freshman athlete by the name of Rachel Rigney, that's now Brown, that actually started receiving offers. Now, now I do understand that the, the rules have changed since you came through, but I remember you getting offers when you were a freshman in high school. Talk to us a little bit about the timeline and what that what that looks like today, and and then we'll get uh, Tanya and Jay will chime in as well as we talk about those things. What 
What do you have to say about those things now? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to date myself a little bit, but 14 years ago when I was a freshman, I was getting offers um, from D1, D2, every level really. Um, but that started early, um, 14 years ago before the rule change. Um, and now that there is a rule change that D1s cannot offer until September 1st of your junior year, um, people have this misconception that that's when their recruiting should start. When, like you said, Robert, um, the identification and recognition phase, which is the first phase of recruiting, so the start of recruiting, um, that still is happening in the eighth and ninth grade. Coaches are identifying these athletes early and continuing to evaluate them throughout the years leading up to September 1st. And September 1st is when the offer is happening, not when you should jump into recruiting and um, you know, say, all right, let's hit the ground running. That is really and truthfully the end of recruiting for some people. Um, you know, that's, that's the fourth phase, the offer. So um, 14 years ago, I was getting recruited as an eighth and ninth grade, was committed my freshman year of high school. That is still happening as far as getting identified and starting the recruiting process. Um, it's just the offers are a little bit delayed. That's it. So let, let's let, and let's think about this real quick. And I'll ask I'll ask Jay or, or Tanya either want to chime in. But but think about this real quick. We, we, we there's we're getting into travel ball season. Travel ball season kicked off officially last weekend and or the weekend before that, I guess Memorial Day weekend is kind of when it officially kicks off, right? And so we're going to get into where all these coaches, the Division One guys, Division Two guys, and then everybody's talking about, you know, are those coaches going to be uh, evaluating kids at the 18U field? Or are they going to be at the 16U field? Or are they going to be at the 14U field? For the big Division One, Division Two guys. And, and Robert, Robert, you know, I run the um, a pretty big exposure in Birmingham twice a year. 250, 300 teams in the fall, 150 to 200 in the summer, and we do 14s, 16s, and 18s. Back when these kids were getting offered in eighth and ninth grade, you couldn't find, find a coach really at the 16 under field much. They were all at the 14 under field. Since the rule change, that shifted a little bit, but I still have 60% of my coaches still going to the 14 under field and about 40% going to the 16 under field. So they're still going to see the younger kids. And, and the reason that is, there's an incredible amount of due diligence a college coach is going to put into your kid before they make an offer. Is this a good kid? That requires a lot of phone calls, a lot of networking. Uh, is she a good player? They want to hear it from more than just two or three people. They want to hear it from several people that agree she's a good player. Is the kid a hard worker? That requires them to call their hitting coach. Sometimes they may call the high school coach. They want to know if they work hard. Are they a good student? That requires calling guidance counselors, looking at what path they're on, what their GPA is. And one of the most important things in that due diligence is they want to know what kind of family you come from. How are your parents? Are your parents going to cause them trouble? Uh, they want to come to the ballpark through a summer, through a fall, watch how your parents interact with coaches, umpires, how they act when things go bad, how they act when things go good. So there's a lot of due diligence that go into the recruiting process before you get to the offer, and they get all of that done before September 1st of your junior year, in most cases, not all, but in most cases. But but for if we were to take a if we were to take a a, a poll of the of the all the teams that got into the, the super regionals, and then we uh, what do we got left? We got Oklahoma and Texas left, right? Yep. And they're playing for the championship. Okay. If we were to go back and talk to those guys, those ladies that are coaching, I'll guarantee you that they would all tell you we're done. We're not really taking any any. 23s, we're done, done. We're, we're not really looking at any 24s uh, because we kind of already got a list of who we're going to, you know, make the call to, right? And then they'll tell you, well, that the freshman, it's a freshman just finished or that eighth grade that's going to be, those are where we're going to be, Jay. And they're, they're starting now to evaluate, identify those kids. And it's a long journey process. Folks, if you're listening, understand, you just heard some, some I mean, some diamonds being dropped on the table. Uh, and and it, Tanya, add some more to that, because I know you're sitting there. You've got a ton of experience dealing with this as well. You know, um, I think the big thing is, is um, like they're saying, it's about getting on the radar at a young age, because especially because when you're young, you don't really know where you're going to end up down the road. So it could be, you know, are you going to be a D1? Are you going to be D2, D3, NAI? You're not sure yet. 
but you do have to work at a young age, you know, that eighth, ninth grade time getting on the radar. And then it's about staying on the radar. Um, I think that's super important. Things have changed a little bit. Um, what is normal, you know, because of COVID, there are some things that are going on that have changed here and there. But as far as the big guys, you know, that's going to be very slim. It's going to be out of necessity, you know, not necessarily that they're still recruiting that 22 or that 23 class. No doubt. And I think one thing y'all, everybody just took away from what we just shared and that you picked up on was, is that, and, and Jay alluded to this, um, y'all finish the sentence with me. It's not always what you know, but it's more about who you know. Who you, who you know. know. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, folks that are watching this today, uh, if you're sending your kid to some showcase, if you're sending your kid to play in a tournament, I don't care what the name is on the jersey of the, of the travel team you're playing for. If, if you haven't had some communication, even in the seventh, eighth grade, if that coach doesn't know who that kid is before they get to that tournament, they're not necessarily there to watch that kid. They're, they already have the list of who they're going to go watch. They're not there to find talent. They're there to evaluate the talent that's already been identified and recognized. Tony, your point, you got to get on the radar. To Jay's point, you got you, you not only that, but you also got to be, you continually got to be evaluated early. And it's it's a journey. If they don't show up one day, watch one film and one video and one game and say, oh, that's the best kid I've ever seen in my life. Let's offer her today. And you know, that, Robert, so many Robert, people leave. Robert, it's not impossible to get added to a coach's list late. But it's True. nearly, but it's nearly impossible. And you, you have to look I, through that ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade year. They've spent so much time diving into those things that I mentioned earlier. They feel like they already know the kid and have a relationship with them. They, it's kind of hard to cram all of that in late with a kid that they haven't been doing that with. I mean, I'm telling you, by the time they get to September one, they the kids that they've done all this due diligence on, they feel like they already know the kid and their family without really talking to them. Yep. That, and that's true. And let me tell you all, too, this that everybody thinks that it's all about metrics. It's all about numbers. It's all about that's a that's a part of it. And Jay, you alluded to that. that that is a part of it. Right. I mean, I mean, look, Rachel, there's a difference between a kid throwing 57 left handed and a kid throwing 62 left handed. Can we agree with that? Yes. Yeah. The ball's different. It moves different. It looks different. It snaps different. OK, so the metrics matter. But at the same time. Folks, what nobody really always wants to grasp, and this is something you've got to get a hold of, and I hope our audience will listen to this. College recruiting is about building relationships with places where your skill set, your talent actually fit. You can want all day long to be a left-handed pitcher throwing 55 and want to play for, I don't know, pick a team that's in the, that was in the, in the World Series and in the, in, the, in the Super Bowl. You're likely not going to get there because the skill set wasn't there. Because there are dozens and hundreds of kids that do fit the skill set metrics, then it becomes down to then it comes down to it becomes a relationship issue of what the coaches have built this time and energy and effort into building some type of relationship with that family, or invested so much time and energy getting to know that family that it's almost like having to get a stick of dynamite to blow a coach off somebody when they've spent that much time getting to know them and they've got that much invested in them. That's human nature, folks. There still is a human nature to what we do. It's not all about metrics. It's got to be part of a little bit of it, but it's got to be there. Let's let's slide on if we don't mind. Let's let's move to uh, this is one of those things that always kind of we're going to talk a little bit about percentages. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, camps and COVID years. But let, let's touch base on this real quick. And, and Tanya, I'm going to come to you on this one. You, you know, we talk about percentages, and and, and as a general rule, it's about roughly 5%, 6% of the kids that play uh, travel high school softball in their grad class get a chance to play somewhere collegiately. Uh, roughly a little less than 2% get a chance to play at the Division One level uh, in, the, in that grad class. So that's there. But talk to us in terms of kind of how this transfer portal thing, this COVID thing has kind of impacted some of recruiting. And I realize I just threw two really big subjects for you to kind of lead us off into here. Uh, but we're all going to have a tremendous amount of, of whew, some add to that. So lead us off with that piece of it as far as the COVID stuff and some of this transfer portal stuff. Okay. So, um, yeah, it, it is 5.6% um, just for NCAA. You can add almost a couple percent for NAIA and JUCO. Um, but that, that percentage, that's 7.7.5% that you're looking at, 
comes out of a figure that's roughly around 400,000 when it's all said and done out of that grad year. So I think when those numbers, when you put in actual headcount, that gives a more of an eye opener on what, <clears throat> what that percent means. Um, but yeah, with, with uh, COVID, um, we've got two years, up to two years eligibility um, extended. Um, that is obviously going to have a big impact on our high school kids as they're getting recruited, um, just because there's so many more athletes out there that are taking advantage of that, whether they attend grad school and can play, um, you know, that's, that's the other option there too, or they opted out a year or two. So during the COVID time, so um, athletic, um, athletic money is impacted by that as well. Big time. Um, you're dealing with, you know, seniors that have become super, seniors, maybe even super, super seniors. Um, you know, that's, you know, if they've got a big chunk of that money, there's less that can be spread out um, for the for the other classes coming in, as well as the roster spots. So we saw a big swell in rosters um, with that. The the amount of athletes that can come in become less unless coach is going to make a cut or the athletes decide to hit the transfer portal. Um, which that's a big topic in itself, um, you know, but yeah, if you look at a program, typically, let's say we just, maybe a program would take five kids in a year, uh, normally. Um, and now you're in a situation where because of code COVID extended rosters or money situations, you're, um, and the transfer portal kids that, that they're recruiting from as well, you're looking at, you know, maybe two to three spots that they'll be bringing in. Um, you know, and that does, it, it impacts our, our kids a lot. We've had um, a handful that have been hit by that schools that have been recruiting them up until the end, but now they're going a different direction because of that transfer portal or their athletes staying on because of the Great. eligibility. Great. Rachel, add to some of that as your thoughts is what you've experienced. And then Jay, I know you've had some real experience too recently with that as well, but Rachel, what, what are your thoughts on how that's, has that impacted the things that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, they it's just made it that much harder for a high school player to get a spot. Um, not only are you competing with your other classmates across the country um, for a spot, you're also competing against the transfer portal. You're competing against JUCO transfers because um, that's a big part of it as well. I mean, a college coach is going to look at the transfer portal and JUCO transfers as, hey, these kids have college experience. They've been there. They know what it's like to compete at this level. So let's use them for a couple of years and then, you know, we'll revamp after that. So, yeah, it's, it's getting even harder for high school athletes to earn a spot. And that's the that's I think that's something that most parents are they have not really. I, I don't think it's registered, you know. What's the old saying? You don't know what you don't know, you know. It'll, 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 register, it'll register pretty quick, Robert. I, I mean, pre I, I've been coaching travel softball for eighteen years with the Thunderbolts. Five pre COVID, it was it, it can be different, but the average recruiting class per school was five kids a year. Now on a year where they had a big senior class, every now and then a school would bring in six or seven. And sometimes if they had a small senior class, they'd bring in three, but the average was around five. That was just the average, clear, clear cut, five kids a year they bring in. Well, I can tell you with the COVID extra years that the players are getting and um, uh, the, the transfer portal, coaches are not signing an average of five kids a year anymore out of high school. They're signing about an average of three. You still may see a school sign five. You may see one sign one, but that average has gone from five to three. They're just not signing as many high school kids. There's tons of talented, proven college talent available in the transfer portal because of the portal rule changes. And um, they've also got seniors and juniors that they can give an extra year to with that COVID year. And those kids have, are proven college athletes. They're going to spend their money on proven, proven players before they spend it on a high school kid that they think is going to be good. So I'm just telling you, as hard as it used to be for me to get all these kids signed, I, it, it's a lot harder now when, they only, when they're when they taking an average of three kids in a class instead of five. And that's just, that's a fact. Well, and then what it needs, what parents have got to understand at this particular point in time is, is that now all of a sudden you have to really understand more than ever where your, where your child's skill sets truly fit. Because if you were a bubble division one kid, if you're a bubble division one kid two years ago, 
you're not a Division I athlete today. As much as that sounds negative to say, the truth is that kid that was a bubble two years ago on the bubble that might be able to go somewhere and play. Listen, I think, uh, Tanya, you shared this with me prior to our meeting that there's 12, as of yesterday, there was 1,268 softball athletes collegially in the transfer portal in the United States. 1,268. Folks, that's almost, if you do the math on that, that's almost 30% of the total scholarship opportunities that would exist on rosters collegially in the country through all levels. Now, chew on that for a second. That means to what every one of these experts have just told us, and what I'm going to tell you now, is that that means the high school athlete automatically coming down right out of the gate. There's less opportunity for them at the highest level because those spots are going to be eaten up by a 22-year-old young lady instead of an 18-year-old girl. And I don't mean that offensive to people because the same thing is happening on the men's side where they can take a 23-year-old man compared to an 18-year-old boy. And so understand that it's the, there's no sexism to that. That's the reality that Jay's talking about, Rachel's talking about, I'm talking about, Tony's talking about. If I'm a college coach and I can go take a proven kid that won in Texas two years ago, bring them back and make them in Oklahoma State, Miranda Eilish is who I'm talking about. She was an NSR, uh, someone that worked for NSR, by the way. If that She had a year of eligibility left. They came out of the woodwork, came and got her, and put her to work. Robert, let's, let's, so people can understand this better, because most softball people are watching the College World Series. Of the four final teams, and I know I'm missing some, but these are just the three I know. The kid that Oklahoma has ridden through the tournament is a transfer from North Texas. Yep. Oklahoma State, Miranda Ellish was a transfer in, and she pitched about 60% of the innings before she got hurt. Um, and Texas, the kid they've ridden through the whole thing, she's on her third school. Wow. She's on her third school. So all three of the four, and UCLA may have some too, I just don't know right off. But those three kids were – at one point or now, the number one pitcher on three of those four remaining teams are transfers. No doubt. And it's not just the pitchers. I mean, you look at the roster. I mean, the whole roster, and it's a transfer from somewhere. So Correct. Yep. I, I, I was blown away by how many were just watching the World Series this week. I'm just like, wow, that's – they just – they're just floating around. <laughs> And think about yes. what that does. Think about what, Tony, what does that do to a coaching staff? What does that do to them when every year they're having to look at their entire roster and they're having to figure out where we go? Because they're not building necessarily not – some coaches haven't changed from it, but many are no longer bringing in kids and developing them to what that's they right. need. They're getting the kid that's already developed and finishing out what they need to win now. That's right. And it, and it makes it a lot tougher, plus you don't know what's going to happen the end of your season um will that transfer stay or will they go somewhere else there's a lot of them that have gone two three summer and fourth their fourth school um you know so it's it's definitely it to a coaching staff you know it's it's a constant and like you said you can't build you know so it's it's definitely different but the the need to win and to compete you know um makes them go towards that transfer portal more you know because that's going to get you more instant on the field versus you know and, and again you look at the development part that's a great thing in itself you get to mold that kid coming in and have them for the couple of years before they're ready to step in and, and and be a big contributor on the field so um you definitely can see the perks on both sides um but it does make it difficult for a coaching staff depending on what they have coming in and leaving um and even stuff they don't know about Absolutely. And then and, and that's what most most of the families that may be listening and will listen to this as it's played back in time over over the years. Some coaches, because they're having to finish their season, they haven't gotten a commitment back yet from that senior, super senior, super, super senior, as you call it. They haven't they haven't locked it down. They have and they can't just cut them loose. They can't just tell them, no, you're got they've got to let that opportunity develop for that athlete. And so that, that landlocks that, that coach many times, that handcuffs them and they can't make a decision on what they need to do sometimes. And therefore they have to go to the portal to replace that kid at the, at the very end, very late. It's a, it's a whole different ball of wax today. It's a whole different game than it was three years ago. 
and the, and and will it ever get back? I think uh, we we may see some normalcy begin to return as the extra COVID year work kind of kind of wears itself out. I think in the twenty four grad class, uh, unless the NCAA makes some additional uh, you know adjustments to that, I think we'll see that kind of come coming down at that point in time. But all that being said, it's changed the the whole lay of the land at every level collegiately, including junior college. And, and parents that are not really in tune to that. And here's why. So many families are not in tune to it because they don't know what they don't know and they're getting information and trusting people that think they know. Folks, if you're watching this, all four people on this camera have spoke to a college coach this week, probably today, multiple times. Every day. Usually seven days a week. I was in the middle of Caribbean on a cruise. Coaches still communicate with me. Because why? I actually turned the Wi-Fi on on the boat. Because why? I couldn't imagine myself, Jay, not being completely out of contact with everybody, you know? So there really is no rest. The point I'm making is, folks, that you have to understand where your child is, where they fit. And you better, you better get somebody that lives in the space every day to evaluate that athlete with you and be honest with you so that you will understand where your kid needs to be looking instead of doing this. And I'm going to ask this panel to nod with me because I mean, so many coaches just tell a kid, Hey, pick your top 20 schools and start sending emails to them all the time. Hey, go to Twitter and, and, and tag every person on Twitter. Now, so look at everybody. Did you grin? Jay, I want you to talk about, I want you to talk about that real quick. I, I, I know it's, it may be a little off, off, uh, off itinerary here, but to, let's talk about that whole idea that I'm going to go tag the coaches and how does that impact kids? Well, I mean, I would never tell a kid not to email a coach or tag them in Twitter. I wouldn't tell them not to do that, but there's also another 20,000 kids doing the same thing. An, an, an average division one coach gets about 400 emails a day. They can't open and read all of those emails. They go through the main screen where the subject line show, not the body of the emails, and they go through deleting those emails unless something in the subject line catches them. If, if they wanted to read every email they got, that would be their full-time job because they literally get hundreds a day. So it's not that they're ignoring you and they're being bad people. They just can't read all the emails they get. They get bombarded with them. So you have to do something different. The, the most important thing I'll tell you, Robert, along these lines, there's a lot of people out there that will tell you that they're going to help you get recruited. It may be a travel ball coach, a high school coach, it may be. And I'm sure all of those people are going to give it their best effort and have your best interest in heart. But they're, they're, they're good they people, Jay. I mean, they're good people. They have the best of intentions. Absolutely. But the one thing I'll tell anybody, that's at, if somebody calls me and their kid plays soccer and they want to get recruited in soccer, I'll tell them the same thing. Find somebody that can show you that they have helped people in the past get signed at colleges. If they've done it before, chances are they can do it again. The ones that have never done it and they say they're going to, they're going to try their best, but you know how hard it is to develop a relationship with a college coach and get them to trust you? I've been doing this 18 years, and the first five or six years of that 18, I worked really hard to try to develop those relationships. And until you've got something to provide them, and they see that you've been telling them the truth, it's hard to gain their trust. Because again, just like with the emails, there's hundreds of travel ball coaches trying to develop relationships with them. And over time, you know, you just find somebody that has those relationships and can, the first question you should ask, well, who else have you helped to get signed? Where have you, where have you gotten kids signed? How many have you gotten signed? And that answer will let you know. And if they have a good answer to that, then you've got somebody good to help you. If the answer's nobody, then that's not the person. Well, and another thing I want to touch on real quick, too, to your point, is that kids, be careful about also which coaches you're tagging when you're in your Twitter and your Instagram, that kind of stuff. Here's why I'm going to share this with you. Jay brought this up, and I'm going to steal it from you, Jay, if it's okay. And you can correct me if I, if I get it wrong. You go out, you're, you're a pretty good player. And, and you go, you are a kid that could be playing at a certain level. And you go out and you tag five or six coaches in a, I don't know, a great play that you made or you hit this bomb, whatever the deal is, you tag those, those five or six coaches. 
those five or six coaches may not have a spot for you, but that coach is in the same conference. The coaches maybe just one level below is looking at that and looking at you tagging those coaches. Their idea then is that kid ain't going to talk to me. They're big time in me or they're not interested in me. So they move on and go somewhere else and they go talk to the kid that maybe didn't tag somebody or, or, or they go trust somebody that Jay's talking about that they've actually talked with. Rachel, you and I dealt with this uh, two weeks ago uh, over an athlete. Division one coach contacted uh, both of us about an athlete and said, hey, what, what, tell me more about this kid. What's her name? What does she do? Can you give me the details? Because at the end of the day, that same coach for the last 15 years has been, or 12 years, has been communicating with one of us and probably communicated with Tommy Barnhill back in the day when Tommy was still with NSR, which predates all of us, by the way. <laughs> So all that being said, it's the relationship stuff that comes into play. And Jay's right on that. And he's right on that. But you can also hurt yourself if you do things that don't make sense. And if you put somebody in a tagline, a coach could walk away from that and say, you know what? That kid thinks they're better than, the, the, than, I, than I am. So they're not. it could hurt you. Be careful about what you do. Be careful about how you handle your social media. That's all. Yeah, this the, the particular the particular story of mine that you're talking about, Robert. The coach didn't get mad or get no. his feelings hurt. He just there's this kid, a 24 pitcher, that's kind of a hot name in the recruiting game, and I mean, most everybody would love to have her. Well, I told Kenny that at Oklahoma State, I said this kid's interested in your program. He said, "Well, we love her, but I I follow her on Twitter, and she tags every." Co coach in the country but me so i didn't think she was interested well i said yes yeah, she's interested but he didn't he wasn't mad he just no, didn't no, no. think he was interested no, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't make him mad it just leads a coach maybe away from a kid that they could so you got to really be careful how you handle your social media so that was a side note that i want to take but jay what a big important note that is for our young people to hear i mean it, it's it's real it is very real let's change gears a little bit we talked about uh transfer portal jay let, let's 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 roll into and every one of us have communicated with schools. And I think this is a great jumping off point. Tell us what the college coaches are looking for specifically as far as, and again, you hinted about this earlier when we first started, but I want you to go into a little more detail. And I know Rachel and, and uh, Tanya will be able to come into it as well. But what are these guys looking for and these ladies looking for in their players, not just at division one level, but all of them. Well, I will tell you, and I know every coach isn't the same, but the consensus that I've gotten over the last 18 years, this is in order what they look for. One is good kids. They can't afford to bring a great player into their program that's disruptive to their team, bad attitude, stays in trouble, constantly making bad grades. They can't have a kid that disrupts the team. Uh, they also can't have a kid that embarrasses the program because that's when the athletic director gets involved and the coach gets in the hot seat. So being a good kid, a good human being, is number one on most of their list, usually at the top of their list. Number two is obviously being a great player. And here's the thing, and this is what a lot of people don't understand. There's a lot of good players out there. A lot of great players. If you start – you know how many pitchers in the 24 class throw 65 and above? It's a, it's a lot of them. It, it really is. And kids that don't get out and play in the big tournaments, the big national tournaments, and never see that a whole lot, they don't understand that there's dozens of kids around the country in this 24 class. I'm using that because that's the next one on the clock. Uh, there's dozens and dozens of kids across the country that throw 65 and up. Now, some of them will throw it over to the backstop maybe, but there's a lot of kids that throw hard. There's a lot of 5'10 kids that can hit a ball 300 feet front toss. There's a lot of 5'10 kids that run a 2.8 to first base. There's a lot of 5'10 kids with huge overhand throws. Now, that doesn't make them great ball players, but when you're talking just the athlete and just the metrics, there's a lot of good players out there. You have to do something to differentiate yourself. Be a better kid. Make a better test score. Um, be a gamer when it's on the line and things aren't going well. You're the one that steps up and makes a play. Those are the little things that separate you from the other kids that, that have great measurables. Uh, the next thing on the list is hard workers. Um, I was going to say work ethic. I was going to say that had to be in the top three. What, what Work ethic would be number three on my list. And look, I've coached kids like this and I've seen a ton of them. There's a lot of kids that were born with a lot of God-given ability and they coast on it. They don't work. 
And, and I'll tell you, that can get you through a high school career and maybe a travel ball career, but it will not get you through a college career. When you walk on a campus, I don't care if you're 5'10", 180, chiseled muscle. Those women, those women, not girls, that have been in that con waiting and conditioning program at that college for three years, those are grown women. <laughs> They're not girls. You show up a girl, you leave there a grown woman. So if you want to compete with those kids that have all that experience and all that uh, time under their belt, you have to be a hard worker. You have to have strong work ethic. Uh, good students would be number four on my list. And I don't mean to minimize it by putting it forth on my list because it's just as important as the other three. But if you're in a heated battle with another kid, let's say you want to go, let's pick a school. Say you want to go to Tennessee. You want to be Tennessee's great next shortstop and they need a shortstop in your class. Chances are there's going to be two or three kids they're looking at for that spot. Well, maybe those two or three kids are all the same skill level and they all check all the boxes. Well, I can tell you a lot of times what your test score and your grades are will be the deciding factor, which one of you three gets that deal. Because in a lot of schools, if you make a 26 or above, they can get you a lot of academic money and you'll cost them less than those kids that made the 19 and 20. If you make a 29 or 30, chances are you're really going to separate yourself from those other two kids that have the same skill set and are great kids. So don't think grades aren't important because I've seen a lot of colleges sign five-star softball players and it not cost them a dime of athletic money because of their test scores. And that's a free kid to them. They love that. And the last thing I'll mention, and this has really, it's all, this has always been the case and a big deal for coaches and it's gotten bigger because of the transfer portal uh, changes. They really watch your parents very closely. In the stands, are you a helicopter parent? Are you a good parent? Do you cheer just for your kid? Do they only cheer for their kid? Um, because those helicopter parents, they know when if they get that kid on campus and they don't play as a freshman, the parents are going to make the kid leave school and go somewhere else. So they've invested a year in a kid that's going to leave. So they really monitor the parents very closely in the family. They're not just recruiting a player. They're recruiting a family. And that – has almost always been the case, but it is really a big issue right now with the portal and people leaving and jumping ship the way they are. So that's real important. Those are the main five things I have on my list, Robert, that I've experienced over Look, the last. And I think, and I think you're spot on with that list too. And I want to, I want to throw it over to to Tanya because I want to tie in something that you mentioned. Um, academics, guys. I realize that many people have read all oh, the NCAA does require uh, ACT or SAT to get to the eligibility center. So we're not going to take it. Oh, we're going to go to a test optional school, blah, 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 blah. Tiny, the, the <laughs> academics, GPA, ACT, SAT scores, do they still matter? Yes. Yes, they do. Um, you know, just, just because it's uh, not required by NCAA uh, does not mean that the individual universities and colleges don't require them. Um, even test optional or test flexible, they're going to be looking at transcripts, APs, you know, AP scores can sometimes edge out if you have a lower score. So they'd still like you to have that test score on there. Um, you know, and they are, if you're competing to get in academically, depending on what it is, you know, um, they're going to dive into all of that stuff. So don't get tricked by the test optional, um, test flexible uh, deal out there. Definitely take your tests. Um, so that you have them and you don't get caught trying to cram it in last second senior year um, or it's too late for an early decision school and you got to go to your two or three option now versus your your top option that wanted you so no doubt and I think that's great information there so uh, Rachel I'm gonna ask you a question because this is something for our audience may not realize uh, folks listen everybody doesn't get a trophy everybody, everybody don't get a trophy I hate to tell you all that uh, just because, you know, just because you have an online website with some organization that's online only that doesn't have one of these people or us talking to college coaches and you name them, they're a diamond does. And college coaches don't pay attention to, to online services because why? There's no skin in it to actually validate to Jay, Rachel, and Tanya's point that there's somebody that's going to be the who you know that makes the connection with the whole process and they'll have somebody they can talk to. But Rachel, I'm going to ask you, because of all the kids that NSR that we choose to offer, I hope everybody caught that. This is this is not everybody gets a trophy. We choose to work with who we're going to choose to work with. After an evaluation, identification, recognition, evaluation phase, we'll tell you where you fit. Go, Rachel. In your experience, 
what's the average grade point average of, of the athlete of the girls you that you work with in the softball world that, that you've chosen oh, to work with? Well, you know, I like to think that my girls go above and beyond, you know, so we're we I'm always amazed by by grade point average from these kids because it's like four point something. And I'm like, how does this happen? But yeah, I mean, if you're the average for me is definitely three, five or above. I mean, across the board, girls, women's sports, three, five or above, easy. And because, because at the end of the day, that will be, to Jay's point, to your point, Tanya, that's going to be one of those differentiating things that differentiate you from everybody else will be what you do in the classroom and what you do on your test scores. Guys, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of kids that are just as good as you. I know that sounds horrible. and Parents get mad when you say that because my kid's playing for this team. My kid made all state as a sophomore. Okay, great. That's, that's wonderful. Somebody voted for that. <laughs> and it's a matter of opinion. We could line up 10 shortstops with five college coaches and the word better would be put out there and we could say, hey, coach, which one of those is the best is better. And we might have five different answers because better is an opinion. It's not necessarily a differentiator. Because at the end of the day, every coach is going to have something that help that really helps them se separate one kid from another. It could be a need. It could be a specific skill set. It could be an attitude. It could be a relationship that they built. It could be anything that comes in. I'm going to kind of wind this down. I'm going to talk about, y'all have mentioned this several times, and you guys have done an amazing job tonight. I want to thank you so much for, I mean, just bringing so much knowledge to the table here. And look, we're not done. I mean, we're, we're going to have to have several more of these over the next few weeks because we'll have more subjects that we need to come in and we really need to talk about. But what I want to end this with tonight is this. And every one of you, all three of you have pointed this out in some fashion or another. Moms and dads, coaches, kids, what are you doing that's different? Are, are you doing the same stuff that everybody else is doing? You're just, you know, you're, you're just going to the same showcase thing. You're going to, you're signing up for the same camp. You're going to, I mean, what about camps? I mean, if you just sign up and go into them, you do realize that when you go play in the legacy, you go play into whatever it is, the same city, you go play in the sparkler, you go play in the what, when you go put PGF there, most of those people are selling those rosters to some organization and the college coaches are getting all those books and all that data, and they're emailing hundreds, if not thousands, of kids, inviting them to camp. Tony, I'm going to ask you a question. And, and is that is that true or false? You were just there. You just yes. coached it. Okay. Yep. And, and Robert, Robert, it's true. And I'm going to tell you, if you if you if you're going to a camp, you better be connected with somebody that has a relationship with that coach, and they call ahead and say, "Hey, you need to put this kid in the in the group A." Because Thank college you. coaches yep. watch one group or two; the yep. other 300 kids never get a look. They never get a look. And that thing of it is, is that, and, and some people will put themselves, well, we're different because we got a camp email. There's a difference between a camp email and a camp invite. Rachel, what you got? I didn't mean to do that. I don't know okay. what's going on. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I, I would say too, just to add on, there's a big difference between a skills camp and a prospect camp. Uh, down and that's going to come too when you've you not that you can't get noticed at a skills camp or do your work and use that to your advantage but a prospect camp that's low numbers you're definitely on that list that recruiting list and they're just trying to narrow it down so there is a big difference in understanding there's a difference there, and we all yeah. know that difference and look camps are, are an important part of the process i mean Absolutely. we're not saying that camps are not a big part of the process because they no, are we're not because but they are Right, they are, but it's later on in the process. It's that evaluation comparison phase that we start talking about camps. That, you know, the coaches already know about you. They're communicating with you and they're asking you to come on to get a closer look or to have one-on-one -on -one conversation with you or see if you're yep. coachable. I mean, there's, this is not a don't go to camps no. thing. This is, if you're going to camp, you better be talking to that coach. And know which camp you actually need to go to. Yes. Right, correct. Based on where you fit. Right. Last thing I want to talk about differentiation, and I'm going to wind this down. If you're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, y'all think about this. You do the same thing over and over and over again, and you think that you're going to get a different result. That is truly the definition of insanity, is it not? Folks, if you're here tonight, you've watched and listened to this, understand you need to get your child truly evaluated. They need to be evaluated. 
you need to know what you're what you're dealing with. I realize you may have a great coach. I realize you may have a great somebody that you talked to in the past. But the truth is, you are not going to talk to anybody that has any more finger on the pulse of what's going on in the daily operation of, of the scouting and recruiting industry than, than these three or four people, plus a whole list of other NSR scouts that are throughout the United States that have access to all the same information that we have access to. Differentiation is a big deal. What are you doing that's different? Because if you're not different, you're just one of many. Get evaluated. Know where you fit. Rachel, Jay, Tanya, thank you so much for making tonight just an, an absolute joy to be able to MC and to work with you guys. We all live in the softball world. We all talk to coaches daily, uh, and it's it's a big deal what you guys do for these young people, and it separates and it differentiates, and that's the reason that every single uh, every single athlete that we choose to work with gets recruited. I mean, it, it, because it's not everybody gets a trophy. It's a selection process. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, if we were all live, I'd say give us give a big round of applause to these three amazing people that were here today. But we can't do that. But thank you all again for being with us this evening. And our audience, thank you so much for joining us. If you need us, nsr-inc.com. It's right here over my shoulder. You can see it. You can reach us. You can find us on the, on the Internet. And you can also contact us. And we'll be glad to get your child evaluated. You guys have a great night tonight. Hey, you got to pick one. Is it going to be Texas? Going to be Oklahoma. We'll see. Everybody have a good night. Take care now. <laughs>